Like moths to a flame, you've thrown caution to the wind for a glimpse into our world. Well, now you're in it. Welcome to Aft Up Stories. Everybody and welcome to part two of our epic podcast on the little people or the fairies. Um, so this uh, this part of the episode is going to focus on some of the stranger cases involving the fairies. Um, so far, we, we've basically talked about uh, you know what they are, where they come from, the, some of the origins of where they come from, um, the culture. And, you know, a couple stories um, and how, like, the fairies trap people using, you know, they, they can twist and turn and, and use illusion to use the force to trap people and so on. But we're going to go into some more um, stranger stories and some more familiar ones, but in a way that most people aren't familiar with. So I'm going to start this with the story of the Longshoreman. Now, this is another story that came from the book by uh, Dale Jarvis. His book, um, Wonderful Strange, and he has a whole section in there on the little people. And this was one of the stories that really stuck out to me, and it involves a longshoreman in, uh, uh, this is in St. John's, uh, actually on Water Street. Um, It took place in 1947 on Christmas Eve, just before midnight. And uh, so the story goes that there was this longshoreman, he finished his shift, and he began to walk the road towards home, when all of a sudden, he happened to find a young boy around the age of six or seven, sitting on the sidewalk, crying and sobbing. Now, as many of us probably would do, the longshoreman asked the young boy what was wrong. And the little boy said he was lost, and he told him that he lived on the south side. So the longshoreman, keeping in mind that uh, this was probably considered uh, a friendly gesture back then. Today it would be kind of creepy if a grown man took some child on his shoulders that, you know, was uh, not related. But anyway, the, the longshoreman grabbed the little boy, threw him up on his shoulders, and he began to carry him towards the south side to bring him home. But it wasn't long after he had started this walk that he noticed that this small, frail little young boy, he began to get heavier and heavier. And not long after beginning this little journey did the man notice that the small boy now weighed what he perceived to be the equivalent of two fully grown men. Impossible, right? Well, it gets stranger. The longshoreman knew there was something wrong. You know, obviously there was something wrong. And oddly enough, uh, you know, he couldn't seem to to twist his neck around to look. He couldn't shake this thing off. Uh, You know, he he, he was struggling with with trying to uh, shake it off of him because he knew that, you know, this was getting heavier by the second. And nothing he could do could get any relief. I mean, he he was trapped. He was locked in. I mean, this thing was on him, and the only thing that he could do was walk. And he kept walking, and, you know, despite all the the effort he made to shake him off and the the strength involved, like this little kid on his shoulder, I mean, he just 
couldn't move it. And he, he was really getting worried. You know, he was getting really worried. I mean, he honestly believed that, you know, this thing was going to get uh, heavy enough that it was literally going to weigh him down, crush him and kill him and leave him on the street. And as the longshoreman started to stumble and his legs started to buckle, you know, people in the street were looking at him like, uh, you know, he must be drunk. You know, I mean, not <laughs> that would be a pretty common sight, actually, back then. Um, but anyway, you know, they looked at him like he was this bumbling idiot with a kid on his shoulders. But this really wasn't his main concern. His main concern was that if he didn't get it off, he was going to be killed by it. So the longshoreman, uh, you know, he, he pushed on and he pushed on. And once he got to the end of Water Street, there was this small little bridge. And this little bridge just happened to go over uh, Waterford River. So we have running water. If you remember from part one of this episode, you know, this podcast, uh, one of the things about fairies is that they can't cross running water. Um, so anyway, the longshoreman, you know, he, he summed up all of his strength, all of his might, and he threw himself over the bridge. And as he did so, he heard this little thing speak in a nasty, snarling voice into his ear. So you have escaped me after all. And just like that, the tremendous weight on his shoulders had disappeared. In fact, the little child had just disappeared. And of course, the reason, you know, I mean, we're going to chalk it up to uh, the whole notion that uh, fairies can't cross running water. And you might be asking yourself, how does a little kid, how is a little kid a fairy, right? Well... If you had, uh, you know, paid attention to some of the stories that we had told and some of the origins on these things, and if you haven't, I'll just remind you, um, fairies can shapeshift. They can use illusion to appear as things that they are not. Uh, they can, you know, even if they are a disgusting creature, they can uh, manip- manipulate you in a way that you look at them and you see something different. So... Like a lot of the stories that uh, we've covered so far, and we will continue to cover, um, you know, this fairy used uh, this illusionary ability to, you know, to, to set the longshoreman up into believing that he was, uh, you know, a, a vulnerable young boy, you know, gaining his trust, gaining his, uh, you know, his, his he, he was pulling on his heartstrings. You know, he was luring in, him into a trap. Just like they do in the forest, just like they do um, when they when they call to people in the forest, and for what reason I really don't know. I mean, it, it does seem like he was going to kill him. Uh, maybe they get their kicks from that. Uh, maybe. Well, that seems to be a very you know common theme with all the different types of fairies is that many of their abilities are centered around um, trickery and, and misdirection. And also their activities um, seem very centered around the theme of, uh, you know, uh, a trickster aspect or, um, you know, it, it, someone very mis- mischievous, you know. And it's, it, it's kind of a strange, you know, you think of it, if, if there's a whole race of, of beings, if there are these these beings, you know, what is in it for them to be constantly meddling with mortals, you know? Well, they get their kicks from it, and that that's our assumption, is that they get their kicks from it. Um, or maybe they're, they're jealous of us. I mean, if we go back to the origin story that says that, uh, you know, the, the little people are actually... Uh, fallen angels that were deemed too weak uh, by the other angels and kept here. Um, you know, maybe they are jealous of, of us, you know, because uh, humans were picked as God's people. Um, you know, may, maybe that's what it is. They're jealous of us. They hate us. Um, that might be all it is, you know, not unlike uh, other entities. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so that, that was one of the stranger stories that I heard. Um, and, you know... I could be wrong, but I'm just going to throw this out there because it just popped into my head. I did hear a story from someone. It, it wasn't one that they wanted 
published. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to say the person, I'm not going to say whatever, but I remember there's something being about, um, something on their shoulders as well that had actually caused them to have, uh, you know, back problems to the point that when they went and got x-rays, um, you know, the, the spine was all curved, weird and stuff like that. So whatever it was, you know, they couldn't see it. Um, they could just feel the tremendous weight on their back and, uh, you know, and you'll see this kind of echoed throughout, like in, in the first story, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the, um, uh, one of the, or maybe I did mention it, the, the, the guy that got shot, the fairy arrow. Oh yes. He had, he had a limp for the rest of his days. Right. And, and, and these are the kinds of things that happen. Like, I mean, uh, uh, you can't see the entity, but you, you know, you have a permanent mark of some kind that, uh, you know, stays with you. So, I mean, that, that was one of our stranger tales. But now we're going to venture into one of the stories that, uh, or I should say a concept in fairy lore, that it, it's not that it's unfamiliar, but there's not a lot of information on it. Or I should say, um, there's certain elements of it that aren't as well known. And we're going to explore it because it's really, really interesting. And uh, I'm sure that uh, any of you who have had experience with this stuff, if you have a story, probably relays on this uh, same topic. And just give me one second as I pour another glass of this fantastic red wine. I'm really liking this wine. Okay, so <clears throat> this story, uh, or I should say this concept, is the fairy lights and missing time. So this is a really interesting aspect um, with the fairies is that they, you know, people who come into contact with, with fairies, I mean, they, they often report seeing fairy lights. Uh, they often report having cases of missing time. And, and, or not even coming in contact with the fairies, but just entering areas that are, you know, are linked associated, to the fairy. Yeah, yeah exactly. They're, they're owned by the fairies. So... Many people are said to have seen what they call fairy lights. Now, you or I, I mean, you know, we're going to say orbs. We're going to say lights. And, the, you know, the distinction between that and, and fairy lights, for anyone who's, like, already making that connection, is that the fairy lights are usually orange-colored lights that hover or seem to bob playfully in the distance, uh, seemingly close to the ground. So I've read a few stories from Newfoundland uh, where many members of, like, uh, say, a given community would gather and actually go out and watch these lights nightly like clockwork. I mean, the, the lights always showed up at the same time. I mean, they could set their watch to it. And, uh, you know, none of these people associated this light with anything bad. Nothing really bad came of it. Um but it was is interesting to them, and so they would go out as a community nightly and watch these things, similar to how you know people might um, gather and watch a meteor shower. We'll say you know, and it, it's a very interesting you know concept, I guess. Um, if anybody's ever heard of the uh, Hesta the Hestalin lights, um, they they're very much. The same way, it's a. I, I believe it's um, um, in Norway. Uh, there's a, a little community that exists in this valley, and the 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 skies above the valley, and you know, even down in the valley, um, people constantly see these long streaking lights or orbs. It, you know, it's it's pretty much every shape and form and color you can imagine. Um, and it's so prevalent that, uh, you know, the local universities have set up research stations to research what these lights are. And, you know, prominent scientific uh, uh, organizations, I'm pretty sure the SETI program uh, even donated some equipment to, to this facility. Um, <laughs> you know, like they've, they've actually you know, really invested some time and money into this. So, you know, for anybody interested in, in, in that, that's is the Hestalin light um, or lights. Um, and it sounds a lot like what you're talking about because the people in this community, you know, regularly see these lights. It's not 
linked necessarily with any ill fortune or luck or anything like that. They just, you know, it's just a fact of life for them. And, you know, and, and that's the interesting distinction between like their story and what I'm going to speak about now, because their story really, you know, they, they weren't afraid of, of the light. Nothing negative have uh, ever came from the light. But, you know, their story is more the exception, not the rule, uh, within regards to the fairy lights. Um, so there are a lot of stories involving the fairy lights that are quite different. Um, it's one thing to see, like, a, a strange light in the dark uh, for curious people like ourselves, I mean, you or I, it would make us, you know, want to go and investigate what it is, you know. And this is especially true when you see a light that is playfully moving around, as if it's trying to get your attention. Um, or maybe better put, uh, it's as if the light has an intelligence behind it and it's trying to communicate something with you. And just as a side note, I just want to tell this little little story, uh, you know, because it relates to an intelligent light. I had a friend, uh, his name was Lenny, and when I was out in uh, college, I, w- I was doing a music program, and like, I don't know, it was, it, anyway, I was in my second year, and I didn't know that, that Lenny had come out. He was doing like a digital animation course. And uh, anyway, it was his first year and my second year, and, and I ended up running into him somewhere, like at a bar or something. And, you know, we started chatting, and I started telling him about, you know, uh, the summer just preceding that because you know, this was around November right so in the summer sometime me and my wife uh, we had seen what you know we're sure was a UFO right and I was telling him the story and then he had his own story and it, it, you know just to point out that this place that we were staying in it was a very small community but it's known by a lot of the locals to be somewhat of a hot spot uh, for UFO activity and anyway, uh, he said that, uh, you know, he was uh, in the dorm. You know, he, he was staying in a dorm. I had an apartment. And he was, uh, they were in the hallway, him and some friends and a janitor. And it was, you know, it was nighttime. And all along this hallway, there were these uh, windows so you could see outside. <clears throat> and they saw these lights in the sky. And, you know, they were watching it and... and uh, they were moving in really strange, like obviously strange ways. And the I, I remember Lenny said that uh, there was this younger guy there, and he was really spooked, and he, he was kind of asking, you know, he, he he was saying things to Lenny almost as if he was trying to tease some kind of comfort out of him. He was trying to look for some comforting words that this wasn't anything sinister. It wasn't anything to be worried about. And Lenny didn't really have any of that for him. Uh, and if if you don't know him, and Ryan, you know him, but he's a very frank guy. Like he's uh, very he, much so. Yeah. Yeah, he's very, very much to the point. He wouldn't be one to be telling tall tales, that's for sure. No, he doesn't exaggerate. He's very, you know, he's he's very uh, uh, to the point. And like I said, he, it's not like he's invested in UFOs. He doesn't really follow any of that stuff. Um, so, you know, it, it really had some weight when he told it. And he was telling me, and he said, you know, and he kind of paused and he looked down. And he said, well, if, if I had to, uh, to explain it, you know, he said, it's as if that life, or it's, it's as if that light had an intelligence. It's as if it was trying to communicate with us. And, you know, the way he said it and the way he looked when he said it, it really sent chills down my spine because there was a... There was almost a sinister air about it. I mean, the whole way that it happened. So to relate the, uh, you know, the the story Lenny spoke of with this light of intelligence um, to the, you know, the fairy lights, it's as if something is beckoning. You know, it's something luring you. Again, this common theme of these, you know, the lure or or communication. So, and that's something that you find um, in, you know, quite a few tales about people looking at UFOs, or they wake up in the middle of the night and they're suddenly compelled to go outside, and they look up and here are these lights in the sky, you know, whatever they are. Well, the inter- course, today yeah. we we call them UFOs. The, the interesting thing, or the parallel here, is that uh, you know, missing time. And, you know, lights are, you know, they're common amongst the fairies and UFOs, 
right? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, we have missing time is a major, major part of both. So anyway, uh, coming back to the um, the fairy lights, you know, and how they're different, you know, not not uh, talking about the first story I told, but uh, some of the, the the more common ones is that, uh, uh, you know, people will, will see a strange light in the dark um, and they'll want to go and see what it is. You know, our curiosity often gets the best of us. And many people have gone to investigate these lights, and they've had very different experiences, okay? So, like, uh, a common one that uh, happens, of course, is missing time. So there have been these folks who have gone out to investigate these fairy lights for what to them felt like maybe 15 minutes, right? But when they come home, they come to discover from friends and family that they have been missing for eight hours. And that's just one scenario. Sometimes they come back and it's days, it's weeks, months. I mean, we're talking variable with time, okay? Like, it's, it's very varied, but it's always dramatic. And it's definitely not 15 minutes, right? So... Sometimes when these people go missing, you know, for long periods of time, uh, you know, like you would expect their relatives, you know, their family, their their neighbors, you know, they they go out to uh, the search for these people. I mean, sometimes there are search crews made up, uh, especially in these small communities, and they look high and low. I mean, they look everywhere for these individuals to no avail. And the missing individuals can't explain it either. Once they come back, um, you know, they come back with stories like they were standing in a stationary spot. They were watching a light for what to them felt like 15 minutes. The fact that they were gone for perhaps weeks is unfathomable to them. You know, how did they eat? How did they survive? Did they drink? It's all wiped. They don't remember anything, right? It's as if, you know, they had... um, Stepped into a different dimension. Time was different. Time passed differently. All these uh, fairy lights, you know, you know, are they purposely luring people into these dimensions? And if so, for what reason? So you know, and you know, we always can't discount the you know the uh, possibility that we're looking at modified memories here as well. You know, yeah. uh, uh, many of the fairies. Traits, you know, again, center around that mischievous ability uh, to trick and deceive. Um, so perhaps there's a there's an element of of you know um, memory implanting or wiping somebody's memory so that the only thing they remember is standing there and looking at those lights for 15 minutes. Well, see, I would be interested to. You know, you know how like uh, UFO abductees they go and get. Pe- uh, Post-hypnotic regression? Yes. I would like to see that same thing done. Maybe I should Google it. Maybe it has been done. But I would like to hear about, uh, you know, someone who had had missing time with the fairies. You know, have them have hypnotic regression done. What what did they see? What did they experience? That would be interesting to me. Because... Most definitely. You know, we got this weird parallel to you, you know, the aliens and fairy people and... But seemingly they're completely different, right? Different origins, different theories, uh, a lot of differences. But at the same time, we got these weird parallelisms. So you know, we have these fairy lights, um, but you know, at the same time, I mean, we, okay, we have these experiences that people go out and they investigate. They have missing time, right? But we also have these fairy lights that are said to sometimes show up before a tragedy or disaster. You know, they're a bad omen. So, many regard these lights as a warning. Um, By the way, other names for these lights, just so you know, it's not just fairy lights. Some of these you've probably heard of, and depending on where you're from, it's probably the uh, more accurate name. Uh, Some of these are Will-o'-the-Wisp, Corpse Candle, or Corpse Light. Uh, And in this case, it gets its name from the lighting. You know, this light will light the way from the dead person's home to the graveyard. And then we have the jack-o'-lantern, which we all associate with Halloween. And there are also stories that tell these lights in, you know, these dark forests. 
and basically what what would happen would be uh you know these people would be traveling through the forest i mean we're talking back in the uh the 1800s and stuff like that i mean people used to walk uh shortcuts and trails all the time through through the woods and they would see um you know these lights and they they would assume it would probably be someone walking with a lantern or something so maybe you know it 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 was guiding them maybe they they thought it was the way to town or whatever and these lights would actually lead travelers into hazardous bogs or over cliffs or otherwise dangerous or fatal situations of course you know this varies by legend so some legends give examples such as uh you know a dark hooded figure uh using a corpse candle to lead a traveler onto say a high unstable bridge and by the time the person gets to said bridge the figure will be on the other side. It will look back and let out this evil laugh before disappearing. Uh, other legends say that these figures carrying the light are guardians of treasure. And that though the path may be treacherous, the rewards are untold riches. And then there are the stories where the light isn't being carried by anyone. It just floats on its own. So it's kind of like that orb kind of uh kind of thing like you and i saw ryan like uh you know when we were doing the 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 red orb in the woods yeah the old highway thing right and yeah. for any of you that want to get the backstory on that we have a podcast on that as well it's called the old highway um you can go check that out but anyway um other places in the world you know they say that the uh, will of the wisp is a spirit of the dead that cannot enter heaven or hell so it leads unwary travelers into marshes and dangers. Uh, in fact, there was a book by uh, Catherine Briggs called A Dictionary of Fairies. And it has a very creative story. Uh, the story is that St. Peter gave a second chance to this evil blacksmith who was named Will. And I don't want anyone making that uh, <laughs> comparison to me. But anyway, uh, you know, this this evil blacksmith, uh, he lived such an evil life that he was forced to wander in purgatory. And the only, the, you know, the single comfort that he was granted by the devil was that he could carry this burning piece of coal that he could use to warm his hands on the endless lonely walks into the wildlands. And, of course, he is an evil blacksmith after all. Uh, he used this uh, little burning coal to lure people into marshes and danger, <laughs> right? So, uh, once a bastard. I mean, what else would you do, really? Right? Yeah, once a bastard, always a bastard, right? I mean, you, you give him a comfort, and the first thing he looks to is how to manipulate it to hurt people. So, I mean, that's that's what he did. But anyway, uh, that's pretty interesting. So, I mean, is this uh, you know one one poor evil bastard roaming the, the, the forest, warming his hands with a coal, bringing people over the, the cliffs and into the marshes? Well, who can say? Um, but that that is some of the theories and, and stories behind the fairy lights. What you're probably not too familiar with, though, is the story of the changelings. Now, that is a very, uh, very you know, it's not, it's not a common part of fairy lore. You don't always see it, but it, it's an interesting piece nonetheless. Uh, the notion or the idea is that sometimes a fairy will steal a mother's baby and replace it with one of their own. Okay, so usually the fairy that is swapped, um, it, you know, it's because the fairy is deformed in some way. Like they have a lame hand. Or it's uh, unusually sick. You know, they, they, they don't expect this fairy to make it. In fact, uh, the fairy baby is usually dying, which is why they switch it in the first place, you know, so they could have a, a healthy child, even if it is human. So the mother of the human baby not only loses her actual baby, but she then has to watch what she believes to be her baby get sicker by the day and soon... She has to watch it die. So that's pretty uh, pretty messed up. Now, this is not uh, always the case, though. Uh, sometimes the babies are once again swapped back years later. So, I mean, there's there's some things we're going to discuss now of why that is. Okay? So, how, first of all, how do parents recognize a changeling outside of a sudden deformity? Because let's, 
let's just break it down now. Usually these changelings look very, very much like their baby, okay? Uh, apparently, the differences in a changeling is that it is almost always ill-tempered. You know, they're crying and screaming. It's much more aggressive. Uh, it's much more piercing than a normal baby's. And when the parents look into the baby's eyes, you can see a wisdom well beyond their years. The eyes are usually really dark, uh, the baby's arms and legs are supposed to be really bony. I guess that would be an obvious uh, difference, though, right? If your baby was chubby and you came in, then they were bony the next day. I guess that would, that would be pretty obvious. Pretty pretty big dead giveaway. Yeah, that, that would be pretty weird. I'd be pretty freaked out. You know, I was like, what What the hell? I, I fed him. <laughs> I fed my kid. I'm not a terrible parent. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's something that happens. Um, the other thing is that the baby usually has... A full head of hair and a full set of teeth. You know, not uh, really common for like a, a, a really young infant. Um, when a changeling is brought into the home, ill fortune, of course, of course, always comes with it. So the family fights a lot more. You know, there's more money problems. There's more sickness in the family. There's accidents. Everything just takes a dramatic turn for the worse. Interestingly enough, though... Uh, the original baby is usually brought back some years later. Or perhaps, better put, the babies are once again swapped. But if the parent ever wants to see their baby again, then the rules are they have to respect and love the changeling despite all the trouble it brings. This is the only way they can ever hope to see their baby again. And that said, there are other ways that parents can get their babies back. But the whole idea is that, you know, they, they bring them this sick, dying fairy, okay? This dying fairy child. The fairies believe that their child's going to die. But if the parents love this child like their own and they nurse it back to health, you know, the fairies all of a sudden say, well, you know, the, the child is, is, is good again, and I'd much rather have my biological healthy baby than a healthy human baby. So that might be all the motivation that they do to switch them back. But for any parent who just happens to get in that situation and they want their baby back, um, one, you know, besides, you know, being good to the changeling and hoping that they swap them back years later, uh, one way is through the use of specific magical spells and rituals. Of course. That kind of goes in everything paranormal ever, right? Yeah. Uh, the next thing is that the changeling is delivered, uh, you know, if the changeling is delivered sick, just like I said, if the parents love and nurture it back to full health, uh, you, know, the, you know, the fairy parents usually want their biological kid back. Um, in some areas, fairies are considered demons. So the stolen baby is not considered stolen in the literal sense, but they're actually considered possessed. And that's an interesting thing because we're talking about fairies who are probably, you know, who are, are, are connected to possibly fallen angels, right? Anyway, like any possessed person, they can be exorcised. However, unlike exorcisms that we are familiar with, done via religious texts, getting the demon's name and casting it out in the name of Jesus Christ, and etc., and I, I really don't advise that you do this, even if you believe it. But it is done by beating and torturing the changeling so that the demon wants to actually leave the body. Which actually literally means beating and torturing the baby. You know, your baby, who you believe... To, you'd have to be ha have some conviction to even try that. You, yeah, you'd have to be pretty sure of, of what was going on. Yeah, but even if you did, even if you did that and you, and you drove the spirit out, then you're looking at your poor child is beat to crap and you did it. I wouldn't be able to live with that. Um, no. So, you know, for all of you people, you know, for <laughs> if there's any of you people who actually have a what you believe to be a changeling, let, let's do option one and two. Let's not beat your babies. Really, really against that. Let's not do that part. So, other times, um, fairies apparently don't even swap the babies, uh, but they steal them. And what they do is they integrate them into their own flock, and nobody really knows why. Okay? And 
for whatever reason, years later, these babies return, but usually changed in some way. You know, they have a different personality. Uh, and they usually have what they call a, a special gift, okay? Maybe they're the, you know, they can be the, a master at herbal works. Or maybe they have some kind of magical ability. These are the kinds of things that, you know, are regarded as this special gift. And when they steal a baby, you know, they replace it, um, you know, the, they often replace it with an enchanted piece of wood. And I know that that, that sounds really crazy, uh, but the, the piece of wood is enchanted. I mean, this sounds just like it's, it's out of a, a fairy tale, but it's enchanted to look and act like a real baby. Uh, but when it's in the process of dying, and when it finally does die, you know, what remains in the cradle is literally a piece of wood, right? And, and that's, yeah. how, th that's how they know, right? That's how they, you know, I mean, how, how weird would that be? You got this sick baby... You walk in one day, and you see this, this strange piece of wood in the crib. I don't know what I think. I mean, that's pretty fucked up. I, I don't that's, think that's a, a pretty big, uh, you know, jump to to make. <laughs> well, obviously, a fairy took my baby. Yeah, like where did that magical? <laughs> where did that uh, come from? Yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the wood itself, I believe, that's uh, called a stock. Um, or what is referred to, you know, the it's like sometimes I've read that it's it's um, crudely carved, you know, into the likeness of the child, and then there's an enchantment placed upon it so that it, you know, looks and acts like the the child, or sometimes you know, it's it's not a baby, uh, an infant, it's a it's an older child. Um, but in, in, in all or most or I, all the ones I read anyway, I would say most instances, the the glamour, the illusion is designed so that it it appears sick and dying. And it's, you know, like it's not going to last. Um, now, one of the, you know, strange concepts that I came across was, you know, the the reasoning behind taking these children, you know, like why would fairies take babies and one of the ones i came across that i thought was kind of interesting was that um by nature the fairies are you know kind of a um a weak and sickly people to a degree and um i've seen a lot of of information talking about how they're you know whatever world they're from the food is poor in nutrition and it leads to them being constantly sickly and that one of the, the ideas is that these children are being brought in and eventually are, are breeding with the fairies and introducing, you know, healthy uh, um, genes into the, you know, into the local gene pool. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're severely inbred, something to that degree. But it, it certainly does, you know, with all the mystical um aspects of, of fairy lore it's it, I, I always find it interesting when they detail these very you know flesh and blood problems you know like their food is shit so they <laughs> have to steal hours to survive their babies are often born sick and weak and you know sometimes they will swap the baby uh, in the hopes that the you know the human parents will um, be able to nourish a child back to health. That even the breast milk from the fairy mother is sometimes too lacking in nutrition. So you know they do the old baby swap, and I guess it's a if they're using humans as breeding stock um, to you know fortify their own bloodlines. Then I guess it's a, a double plus for them. You know, hopefully the human parents are able to nourish the sickly fairy baby back to health and um at the same time uh the the abducted human um child is able to you know help out the fairy community by introducing some you know new genes to the it it, it strikes me as an odd you know uh juxtaposition between the the very real flesh and blood problems that you know 
uh, or the real problems that would would be associated with flesh and blood beings. And then we have this very ethereal, magical, mystical side that you know really doesn't seem to follow any of the physical laws per se. Um, and it, it's it's one of those. I guess it's a reoccurring theme for the for the, for all fairy lore and stories. Is that it's 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 always it seemed so chaotic and and unplaceable. You know why would they do that? Why you know. Are they, are they magic? Are they are they people? Are they, you know, what are, are they spirits? Well, if they're having babies, obviously they can't be just spiritual entities, you know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So many questions, you know. Well, you know, uh, another interesting parallel, and I've been finding them uh, as as we're speaking about it, but the uh, you know the parallelism from the fairy. Uh, I mean, isn't there a similar thing with with uh, aliens? You know, crossbreeding with humans because uh, you know they can't reproduce, or for whatever reason, you know they're sick, or you know they they need the humans to uh, act as a surrogate for the kid, right? Yeah, um, that's so, right. So we have that with aliens too, right? And and you know, again, like the, there's that parallelism between the aliens and the the uh, you know the the people and again with the the fairies and the people but you know let's take it a step further and go back to the origin story and talk about the fairies within regards to angels okay and then we're going to go into the uh the fairies and demons so <clears throat> though fairy lore is you know i mean we've mentioned this several times but it's very prominent in ireland right they actually have lore for the fairies all over the world. I mean, in North America, there is a Cherokee tribe um, in the Carolina Mountains that not only believed in fairies, but they believed in several different types of them. Uh, not unlike the Irish folk, uh, the Cherokee tribe also believed, you know, that uh, fairies could be evil and mischievous. And, you know, we've heard the same thing with Jin. We've heard the same thing. We've heard the same thing with demons, uh, you know. It, it's it, all kinds of spirits. I mean, this is a is a common blanket term here. But anyway, um, the the uh, not unlike the Irish folk, uh, the Cherokee tribe also believed that uh, you know, besides being evil and and, and uh, you know, and mischievous, there were there were good ones. And the good ones, um, you know, they would consider to be nature spirits who, you know, guarded the mountains, the wildlife, trees, and shrubs. They actually have stories where they believe that the uh, the good fairies have helped them on hunting trips. You know, so they believe that there was these fairies that would help them, you know, whether it be helping them with their crops or, you know, guarding the, uh, you know, their natural resources, helping them hunt. And then there were the bad ones who were, you know... Uh, I don't know if, if any of them have been murdered, but, uh, you know, certainly there have been bad things done. I wouldn't be surprised if there were murdered Cherokee people. I mean, there's been other people supposedly killed by fairies. So, yeah, we have good and bad, right? So I'm going to tell you a story now that uh, takes place in the late 1800s. Uh, there was a pretty spectacular sighting at a place called Chimney Rock in North Carolina. It involved a professor who was home one day when he got a knock on his door from some children who told them th or told him that, you know, there was these uh, people floating around on the side of this mountain, uh, Chimney Rock Mountain. So, of course, the professor didn't believe it. You know, of course he didn't believe it. it sounds like bullshit. I don't know if I'd believe it. Um, but. He assumed that it was a prank and, you know, he just sent them on their way, went back to doing whatever he was doing. Five minutes later, he had this other knock on his door. And this time, it was from an older woman who was telling him the same thing that the children had just told him. Only she said they were ghosts floating around on the side of this mountain. You know, she was all excited, and she was pressure, uh, pressuring him to come and look. So he said, fuck it, I'm going to go check this out. You know, he followed the woman with the intent 
on getting there and just proving her wrong. You know, he was going to explain whatever this was in some way it made sense. You know, he was going to break it down in practical terms. But when he got there, he, he saw it too. And what he saw were dozens of bright entities, as they said, and there were multiple, uh, multiple spectators to this event. There were dozens of bright entities floating around the side of the mountain. Interestingly enough, though, he said, and the kids, believed these to be fairies. You know, they were noted uh, to be wearing white gowns. They looked like humans, only smaller, uh, rather than the little people, you know, with the in green with the giant beards that, you know, we see. You know, they saw them in these white, you know, dare I say, angelic kind of gowns, and they were flying. And these beings were of men, women, and children. There were apparently dozens of witnesses. And this story was pretty well known and, uh, you know, documented for several years there. Uh, But not surprisingly, and I can see where this came from, but years later, people, of course, labeled these as angels rather than fairies. But there are a lot of paranormal entities that, uh, you know, there are some details that overlap. You know, I mean, so, is this a case of both? I mean, there's some similarities here. So, uh, th- you know, there was the origin theory that uh, these are fallen angels stuck on Earth. They are often depicted with wings. You know, I mean, look at uh, any of you guys who have played the game Zelda Ocarina of Time. You got this fairy named, uh, what was her name? Navi. Navi, Navi right. And Navi had wings, or if you watched uh, Captain Hook, you know, you had Tinkerbell, and Tinkerbell had wings. She was a fairy. So, I mean, we, you know, again, like angels have wings, right? I mean, if you have children who are in a play, they often wear costumes that have wings. But, you know, then there's those, uh, those other depictions where they're just little men in green, with big beards, right? Yeah. So uh, who's to say which is real? But again, we have this overlap. So, you know, we, we, we have this... On top of that, you know, besides the wings and stuff, uh, the, these particular, you know, um, beings that they had saw had this glow to them. Um, you know, so again, we have this association with the light. You know, we have the fairy lights. And, you know, mysteriously enough, again, with the fairies... You know, they had this aversion to religious artifacts. You know, they, you know, they, it's just like, you know, a demon can't touch holy water. A demon, you know, they don't want to be around crucifixes and stuff. And we had the same thing again with the, uh, with the fairies. So are they really fallen angels? Are they fallen angels that the rest of the angels said, you guys are too small and weak to fight the spiritual war. You're doomed to stay here. You can't follow us into hell, right? I mean, is that what that is? Is that how they got their powers? You know, all angels, I guess, would have some kind of power. Is that where these little guys got their power? Or do they have, like, you know, do they have some kind of dimension that overlaps with our own? You know, I I find it really neat when we're, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, some pretty obscure concepts, but... Um, I heard a theory from a, a gentleman who claimed that um, by using dowsing rods, um, and if, you, if you're not sure what a dowsing rod is, definitely go look it up. They're interesting little devices, like these little L-shaped metal rods, and you know, generally they stick straight out in front of you. But if you, you know, you're seeking something, or you're in an area that has energy or power to it. Um, that the rods will will begin to move uh, until they cross one another, and this guy was walking around. Uh, I do. It may have been Ireland, uh, and and you know, entering a area that was supposed to be you know like a a fairy wood or a fairy circle or something. And when he did, his dowsing rods would cross. But he made a point of of saying, but when I think of the Lord and I speak the Lord's prayer in my mind and 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 call upon the Lord. Um, the rods on cross, like there's something, 
you know, disrupting their power or, or and, and his theory was that, you know, there are areas upon the earth that have, um, you know, very chaotic energies, you know, whether it's, it's related to magnetism or what, you know, he couldn't say, but that, you know, there are areas that have, have these chaotic energies. If there's any one thing we can say about the fairies is they're, they're chaotic, you know, um, but he said, you know, the, the idea of the Lord and the energy associated with the Lord is a very ordered kind of energy. Hmm. And that he feels that that order imposes itself upon the world when you, you know, sp speak the Lord's prayer or, or you, you, you brandish religious, uh, uh, paraphernalia and that, by doing that, you actually order the chaotic energies that are, are you know, kind of out of control in this area or, or, well, whatever they're doing. And, you know, there's something about the, the, the energy of, of, of the, the Christian God that is ordered and, and, and can force itself upon the, the, the chaotic energy. I just, you know, it, it seems like, like a... a, a I guess for um, as far as any of this stuff goes, you know, it's uh, um, it seemed a, a interesting concept, you know. Uh, oh, for sure. It, it made made sense in terms of, you know, okay, fairies, chaos, Christianity, and the the Christian God uh, order and order being imposed over chaos. You know, it certainly made sense to me. Yeah, that that's actually some really interesting. Um background there um so you know jumping from the the connection between the fairies and angels i think it's time we talk about the similarities between fairies and demons so like demons fairies have an aversion to religious artifacts but they also have magical powers, and most stories detail them using their powers to mislead people into traps, such as, as the, uh, the use of fairy lights, a.k.a. will-o'-the-wisps, right? They also harm people, such as with, uh, you know, the story with the guy uh, that got hit with the fairy arrow, and they steal people's babies. I mean, that's pretty in intense, right? Not, not to mention the, the possession, Oh, hell yeah. You know, you get the possession. Again, we, we got the, the demon connection there. They've been known to kill um, farmers' crops and uh, sour the cattle's milk. You know, they uh, they bring bad fortune upon people, not unlike uh, a curse. You know, they kidnap people for days and weeks at a time. I mean, you're talking about missing time? Well, yeah, sometimes they actually come. I mean, I mean, there's nothing short of being um, abducted. I mean, if you really want to look at it like that, because somehow they survived, they were fed, they, they drank, unless it was a different dimension and time just didn't uh, interact the same way. But anyway, they're known to uh, kidnap people, right? Uh, they caught, and, and of course, this causes grief amongst the families and communities of the people. Um, and speaking of kip, uh, kidnapping and luring people into dangers... To them, it seems like playing. You know, they use these lights that playfully bounce around. And they, you know, they pretend to be like like that story with the longshoremen. You know, they pretend to be these innocent children, these harmless little things. You know, they, they, they pull at your vulnerabilities. And then they, they try to, you know, harm you in some way or kill you. It's a lot like a demon. And, I, and I've thought about this. It's a lot like a demon... At a Ouija board, telling lies to trick people into making bad decisions, or just lying for the sake of you know scaring and hurting people. I mean, and this is something that we see all the time with negative stories with the Ouija board, which of course there are many. So when you break down the similarities, um, it certainly does seem like the fairies and the demons are a lot alike, you know. But at the same time, you know, there's this distinctions you know fairies are not as powerful as demons apparently um you know they can um they really make one consider the origin that uh uh you know these are 
fallen angels, like the other ones, but they're weaker angels. You know, they're they're forced to stay here because they weren't considered strong enough to join the others in hell, fighting for Satan in the spiritual war. Right. So either way, it seems like uh, they, you know, I mean, really, I mean, the, the the main powers that they seem to have is this command of things in our dimension. And another, like, you know, for whatever reason, they, you know, whether it be jealousy, blind hate, or misplaced anger, uh, most fairies seem to like to want to target us and victimize us. You know, they, you know, they trap us, they lure us, they, you know, I don't know what the reason is, but it it's not really uh, a positive thing. I mean, we do have a couple of good stories, like the old lady with the... Uh, with the oranges, you know, they kept her alive for uh, all the time she was away. But, I mean, the majority of these stories are, again, like the, the people are victims, they're prey to these fairies. And uh, when, they, when they don't kill them, it seems like they're playing. You know, it, maybe it's just fun for them. I, You know, if you hated somebody, maybe you'd want to troll them. Yeah, right? Like, uh, that that's what it reminds me of. So... You know, looking at all the stuff, or, I mean, or some kind of, you know, like you said, this misplaced anger. Perhaps it's a, a lashing out. Um, you know, I, I always think when I think of you know beings existing in a world parallel to ours, so close, I can't help but always, you know, take, make that mental leap to the jinn. Yeah, you know, they 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 were more than humans, but less than angels, and. For whatever reason, they pissed off the powers that be, and were were cast out, you know, of the of the fully material world, you know, and and kind of pushed into this this place that you know exists, but is less real than here. You know, it's it's less. It, and furthermore, I mean, it's it. You know, they want it to be here. The Jin want it to be here. There's something more appealing about our world than theirs. And then, you know, with the fairy lore, it's, you know, their food is crap and, you know, there's a lot of parallels there. And here they are, the, the, these people who have been, you know, and some of the stories say that they've been, pu- they were, you know, the first people and they were pushed out by the coming of, of man and for one reason or another. And, you know, perhaps they're, they're you know, they've never forgiven us for that, you know. Yeah, well, I, you know, since you put it the way, the way you put it, I could almost see that, you know, a fairy sitting down, he goes to eat a sandwich, he's like, oh, that's fucking terrible. Yeah. And, he, and he's looking at the farmer's ranch, he's like, yeah, well, fuck you and your crops and your milk, I'll fucking sour all of it. Your butter so, and your honey. Yeah, you, you fucking know. bastards, here I'm eating this garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Right, but yeah, I mean, it it could come down to like a a jealousy and a, you know, a, just a a hatred towards. I mean, really, I mean the 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 angels, I mean the the demons. I should say. I mean, apparently they hate us, you know, and the the, the angels that chose to follow follow Satan. I mean, we're not going to get into that whole topic because that is its own podcast if we wanted to do it. Yeah, but that, that could be a whole series of that, podcasts. That could really. be a series of podcasts, yes. But the idea that, uh, you know, they're angry and jealous because we were chosen as God's people, right? Um, it, we, it was favor, favoritism. It was, you know, all these things where they were already there. They were, you know, and I can see that. I can understand that. Um, but again, like from my point of view, I didn't really do anything. I didn't even ask to be here. I'm just here. In this world of shit, where shit happens all the time, <laughs> right? I mean, God Who are they help to be us. mad at me? I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't do anything. I didn't ask to be born. Um, but whatever, you know, we're stuck here. We all got our trials, our our problems, our issues, and goddamn, that wine helps. <laughs> it really helps. But Ryan, did you want to tell that? Uh, Terrence McKenna story before we wrap yeah, this up. Yeah, I, I definitely wanted to, to throw that in there. I mean, I, I don't think any any talk of, of fairies, at least in the modern day, uh, would be replete without um, mentioning Terrence McKenna. For those of you who don't know, uh, Terrence McKenna was a, a grand 
uh, ethnobotanist. Um, he studied hallucin hallucinogenic plants, basically, and he spent um, a lot of time, in, you know, in a hallucina uh, hallucinatory state. And during that time, um, he described how, with the use of dimethyltryptamine, better known as uh, DMT, he was able to repeatedly experience um, the presence of these beings, and that when he when he met them, you know, they came they came up to him like he described them as like self dribbling basketballs, almost of of energy, and they 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 all surrounded him and you know called out to him, you know, not to be. Uh, um, in, you know, completely odd by what he saw, like, don't be, you know, a paralyzed by astonishment, basically. Um, and they, they would begin to sing and as they would sing, they would call into existence, um, these shapes and, and, and objects that he began to realize were in their own way alive. Um, and, you know, the way he describes them is even, you know, uh, uh, difficult to, you know, and if anybody who's ever uh, been on any kind of hallucinatory ch trip, uh, you know, can explain to you that coming back to this world and telling, you know, other people about it is sometimes impossible. Um, the things that you see and experience are not always transferable to to the three dimensions of, of space that we live in. Um, but he described them as, as being like Fabergé eggs or looking like toys that you would see strewn about uh, a, a nursery in a UFO, like just the most bizarre and exotic things that you can imagine. And that these, these little creatures that he termed the machine elves would encourage him to sing and to 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 manifest creations of his own and that he would and together they would they would sing and and cavort and and create um these living entities together and that was a a very common uh experience for him uh so much so that you know he was able to to retain the information and i guess that's the the difficult part is is the retention of of what you cuz you don't always come back it's like a dream you know, like you remember the dream as soon as you wake up, but then, you know, by your lunch break at work. Oh, it's gone. Uh, if you don't jot gone, it down. You yeah. know, and, and I mean, uh, um, hallucinations are a lot like that, too. Yeah, I could see that. So I guess you would have to have the equivalent of a dream journal. Right? Um, yeah, you know, or uh, again, it's one of those things where, you know, practice makes perfect. So, you know, it's you're either keeping detailed notes, which is rather difficult because even when you come down, um, you know, there it, there's various gr degrees of coming down, you know. And, it, you know, it's one of those things where it has to be done with the right mindset and the right setting. You know, I'm not suggesting people run out and start eating mushrooms by the handfuls, you know, but the... The, like shamanistic um, traditions are are rife with little entities and and spirits that are connected with these hallucinogens, and that by taking them in a ritualistic fashion and um, preparing your mind for this journey, that you're able to interact with a, a world that is right next to our world, but um, not this world. And it's it's inhabited by a, a a whole array of entities, both negative and positive and benign, um, you know. And it very much uh, echoes everything that we've been talking about tonight in terms of the fairy lore. Um, that you know, mostly we're talking Ireland, but I guarantee you, you know, you look at Scandin Scandinavia. Um, all across Asia, any of the the uh, uh, Native American traditions, you're going to find similar stories, you know. And I, I find it very 
I, I guess, comforting in a way to know that uh, that this world is, you know, you can spend months and years meditating to try to break through or, you know, you can take a, a, a weekend and a bag of mushrooms and uh, head out to uh, head out into nature and, and perhaps commune that way. And it's, you know, a, a very real tradition that still goes on in, in, you know, tribes and places all over the world. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it is a, it's a really interesting revelation. I mean, and I mean, we could do a topic. I mean, we could do a whole podcast on, uh, you know, mushrooms and hallucinations and... And perhaps we will. And perhaps we will. Um, but, you know, just... Grabbing it back to the fairy lore, I mean, I, I think we've wrapped up the, the majority of it here, but I mean, I do, I, I would like to hear from you guys if you had had any experience with the fairies, um, you know, particularly if you're in one of the known areas, such as Ireland. Um, I actually plan to take a trip out uh, myself to an area in Newfoundland on my vacation in August. And I'm hoping to um, visit some of these spots where the uh, the fairies are known to, you know, I, I, I guess be seen, areas that they have claimed. I'd see what I can find, see what I can bring back. And, and even if I can't bring anything back, maybe just for the own personal experience. But, uh, yeah, I'm always interested to hear what you guys have to say. If you guys have your own effed up story or pictures or something of that nature you can certainly submit that to us at our official website which is effedupstories.com that's e-f-f-e-d-u-p-s-t-o-r-i-e-s.com and um yeah you're gonna have to communicate on our website that's the new thing uh we, we got really the uh youtube comments because fuck the trolls we can't really handle that anymore um i you know, we, we like doing these shows, but we don't really care to do it to be personally attacked. And 6% of all comments, uh, according to a study, that's what it is. So we're not the first, we're not the last uh, channel that have uh, had to re get rid of our comments. In fact, there's been really big media sites. I think CNN was one of them. I could be wrong. But anyway, there's big sites that have had to do the same thing. It's just fucking toxic. And it, it ruins any motivation that we have to do the show. So uh, hopefully you will join us on the official website where I have more control with how we want to deal with these kinds of folk. And uh, we can still communicate and get your stories and get the ball rolling. We do have some new uh, stories coming soon. Uh, we're planning on doing one on Giants. And we're planning on doing one on a... I can't remember the name of it, but it's a very, very strange entity uh, known in Japanese culture um, that are known to arrive in almost like a, a very concentrated small area effect of almost hurricane-like winds that will throw people to the ground, cut them to the bone, but no blood comes out because it's like vampiric. It drinks the blood. Really, really messed up stuff. So I'm hoping that we can do that as well. I don't think it's very well known. And that's kind of our niche. We just do stuff that nobody's heard so much about. And we're going to be doing more of that. Um, so yeah, I hope you catch us next time. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And again, if you have your own effed up stories, you can submit that to us on the official site. That's effedupstories.com. E-F-F-E-D-U-P-S-T-O-R-I-E-S.com. And this is Will saying, I will catch you next time. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. Good night. He started to buckle. You know, people in the street were looking at him like, uh, you know, he must be drunk. You know, I mean, not <laughs> that would be a pretty common sight, actually, back then. Um, but anyway, you know, they looked at him like he was this bumbling idiot with a kid on his shoulders. But this really wasn't his main concern. His main concern was that if he didn't get it off, he was going to be killed by it. So the longshoreman, uh, you know, he, he pushed on and he pushed on. And once he got to the end of Water Street, there was this small little bridge. And this little bridge just happened to go over uh, Waterford River. 
So we have running water. If you remember from part one of this episode, you know, this podcast, uh, one of the things about fairies is that they can't cross running water. Um, so anyway, the longshoreman, you know, he, he summed up all of his strength, all of his might, and he threw himself over the bridge. And as he did so, he heard this little thing speak in a nasty, snarling voice into his ear. So you have escaped me after all. And just like that, the tremendous weight on his shoulders had disappeared. In fact, the little child had just disappeared. And of course, the reason, you know, I mean, we're going to chalk it up to uh, the whole notion that uh, fairies can't cross running water. And you might be asking yourself, how does a little kid, how is a little kid a fairy, right? Well... If you had, uh, you know, paid attention to some of the stories that we had told and some of the origins on these things, and if you haven't, I'll just remind you. But anyway, the the longshoreman grabbed the little boy, threw him up on his shoulders, and he began to carry him towards the south side to bring him home. But it wasn't long after he had started this walk that he noticed that this small, frail little young boy he began to get heavier and heavier. And not long after beginning this little journey, did the man notice that the small boy now weighed what he perceived to be the equivalent of two fully grown men. Impossible, right? Well, it gets stranger. The longshoreman knew there was something wrong. You know, obviously there was something wrong. And oddly enough, uh... You know, he couldn't seem to, to twist his neck around to look. He couldn't shake this thing off. Uh, you know, he, he, he was struggling with, with, with trying to uh, you know, shake it off of him because he knew that, you know, this was getting heavier by the second. And nothing he could do could get any relief. I mean, he, he was trapped. He was locked in. I mean, this thing was on him. And the only thing that he could do was walk. And he kept walking, and, you know, despite all the, the, the effort he made to shake him off and the, the strength involved, like this little kid on his shoulder, I mean, he just couldn't move it. And he, he was really getting worried. You know, he was getting really worried. I mean, he honestly believed that, you know, this thing was going to get uh, heavy enough that it was literally going to weigh him down, crush him, and kill him, and leave him on the street. And as the longshoreman started to stumble... And his legs, like moths to a flame, you've thrown caution to the wind for a glimpse into our world. Well, now you're in it. Welcome to Aft Up Stories. <laughs> Everybody and welcome to part two of our epic podcast on the little people or the fairies. Um, so this uh, this part of the episode is going to focus on some of the stranger cases involving the fairies. Um, so far, we, we, we've basically talked about uh, you know what they are, where they come from, the, some of the origins of where they come from, um, the culture. And, you know, a couple stories um, and how, like, the fairies trap people using, you know, they, they can twist and 
turn and, and use illusion to use the force to trap people and so on. But we're going to go into some more um, stranger stories and some more familiar ones, but in a way that most people aren't familiar with. So I'm going to start this with the story of the Longshoreman. Now, this is another story that came from the book by uh, Dale Jarvis, his book, um, Wonderful Strange. And he has a whole section in there on the little people. And this was one of the stories that really stuck out to me. And it involves a longshoreman in, uh, uh, this is in St. John's, uh, actually on Water Street. Um, It took place in 1947 on Christmas Eve, just before midnight. And uh, so the story goes that there was this longshoreman. He finished his shift and he began to walk the road towards home. When all of a sudden, he happened to find a young boy around the age of six or seven sitting on the sidewalk, crying and sobbing. Now, as many of us probably would do, the longshoreman asked the young boy what was wrong. And the little boy said he was lost and he told him that he lived on the south side. So the longshoreman, keeping in mind that uh, this was probably considered uh, a friendly gesture back then. Today it would be kind of creepy if a grown man took some child on his shoulders that, you know, was uh, not related. Um, Fairies can shapeshift. They can use illusion to appear as things that they are not. Uh, They can, you know, even if they are a disgusting creature, they can uh, manipulate you in a way that you look at them and you see something different. So, like a lot of the stories that uh, we've covered so far, and we will continue to cover, um, you know, this fairy used uh, this illusionary ability to, you know, to, to set the longshoreman up into believing that he was, uh, you know, a, a vulnerable young boy, you know, gaining his trust, gaining his... Uh, you know, his, his, he, he was pulling on his heartstrings. You know, he was luring in him into a trap, just like they do in the forest, just like they do um, when, they, when they call to people in the forest. And for what reason, I really don't know. I mean, it, it does seem like he was going to kill him. Uh, maybe they get their kicks from that. Uh, maybe. Well, that seems to be a very, you know, common theme with all the different types of fairies is that many of their abilities are centered around um, trickery and, and misdirection. And also their activities um, seem very centered around the theme of, uh, you know, uh, a trickster aspect or, um, you know, it, it, someone very mis- mischievous, you know, and it's it, it's kind of a strange, you know, you think of it, if, if there's a whole race of 